democracy has always been articulated as an idea in relationship to limited space. The original Greek notion was the idea of a city polis, a city democracy, as it were. This was reinvented in the, in the early Renaissance period through the Italian city-states. So the first concept of democracy had was a city-bound concept. And then during the modern period, the early modern period, democracy was reinvented, not as direct democracy, but as representative democracy. Democracy was a battle cry for accountability in the ancien regimes of Europe, to bring kings and queens, princes and princesses to heel and replace them, ultimately, the monarchy and the aristocracy, by elected representatives. So the idea was that who rules you is determined by the popular ballot in a symmetrical and congruent relationship such that decision makers take decisions, representatives take decisions for their constituents in a bounded territory and the impact is experienced first and foremost on that territory. Now, this assumption made perfect sense in an age of developing countries, developing nation states, where the key question was how to hold rulers to account to citizens. And popular democracy was almost the natural outcome of that struggle and of that process. The problem we have today is at least twofold. Many decision makers and representatives make decisions not just for their own constituencies, but for others across borders as well. When the UK and the US politicians make decisions about national energy strategy, the price of oil, how they're going to invest and so on, they make decisions with consequences not just for their own countries, but that spill over the borders of other countries as well. For example, some years ago I was in Zimbabwe and I listened to some local people say that they used to think of weather as an act of God, patterns of weather are act of God, but now they understand it as actually the result of decisions taken about fossil fuel, coal fire station plants, oil usage, and so on and so forth. If nation states create a decision-making system just for their own citizens, but if they create decision impacts which transcend borders with huge and serious consequences, often life and death consequences, how can we have a system of accountability that takes these into account? I think people often don't give the EU enough credit. We have to remember that the European territories have been historically among the most aggressive and if not nastiest in the world. The Europeans had an have had an extraordinary history of violence towards each other and violence towards the rest of the world in colonization, and the building of empires and so on. And this of course came to a catastrophic climax in the First and Second World Wars. Now against that background, Europe has had 60 years of peace. Europe has built institutions of collaboration and cooperation that transcend borders, it's built systems of regulation that transcend borders, and it's reinvented the concept of citizenship, such that today you can be a citizen of Glasgow and vote in Glaswegian elections, a citizen of the same person can vote in the Scottish elections, the same person in the UK elections, and the same person for all its limits in the European elections. So we have the beginnings of an idea of multiple forms of citizenship, in which citizens can pursue rights and, and duties within different political realms that overlap with each other in larger and larger jurisdictions. I think this is a profoundly important idea. We need to remember that modern states took three or four centuries to build, that the idea of a sovereign power separate from ruler and rule, separate from religions, took centuries to crystallize that democracies took over a century, and even in Europe, to establish. I think the European Union um, shows that despite great periods of, of violence and violent geopolitical relations, it's possible to fundamentally transform the dynamics of power. It's possible to lock aggressive states into systems of the rule of law. It's possible to create collaborative institutions among the most competitive states that deal with some of the most fundamental things they have in common, markets, economic life, human rights, uh, increasingly environmental issues, and so on. In the rest of the world, we're faced now with a vast range of serious global problems that even escape the boundaries of regions like Europe. Think of climate change, the global financial crisis, nuclear proliferation, the spread of global infectious diseases, the threat of avian flu. I mean, I could name 20. These are fundamental global challenges. And at this level, Europe alone is not an answer. The UN was created in a very different era to the present time. 
the world has changed dramatically. Power has diffused across the world. The world has become more multipolar. We live with the rise of Asia and China. We live with the rise more broadly of the so-called BRIC countries. And these are only partially, if at all, represented in many of these institutions. So these institutions have two crucial flaws, it seems to me. One, they have a system of representation that is anachronistic and too skewed to the old Western powers that have had its, their own way for a long time. And their other flaw is that they depend for their finance, for the money available to the UN and other UN bodies, on the goodwill of the powerful countries to make donations, to offer them sums of money. Now, you wouldn't run a modern state any longer and call it a modern state if it depended on a system of representation that was skewed to the wealthy and that depended on a system of taxation that depended on voluntary donations of the wealthy. And yet effectively at the global level that is what we have. It seems to me the challenge going forward is to democratize our global institutions and if we fail to do so I think they're likely to fragment. Markets alone don't work and unrepresentative systems don't work. So the challenge is can we make our global governance institutions more representative and better funded. Now, if you ask me, are we going to achieve that? I think we face in the future some very crucial tests now. Can we create a new deal over climate change? And the Copenhagen negotiations are coming up soon. Can we create a new deal over nuclear proliferation? The world only has a very short amount of time to decide whether it's going to be generally nuclear or not. Nuclear proliferation is already a fact of life. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is coming up for negotiation. Can we renegotiate it successfully? And thirdly, can we, in the light of this huge financial crisis that we live with now, create new financial institutions to transform the old Bretton Woods systems into an effective system of global financial regulation? In each of these three areas now, the humanity faces a test. If we get it right, we will rebuild multilateralism on a more representative basis and a better funded basis. If we don't get it right, my view is that the multilateral order of 1945 will fragment into regions, competitive geopolitical power situations, and potentially into a much nastier world. The G20 is coming to London on the 2nd of April for a crucial series of meetings focused on the following questions, parts of which we've already discussed, is can we st stabilize the world economy can we find new financial levers? Can we agree on new instruments of macroeconomic policy? Can we restructure global financial institutions? The question is, will there be sufficient leadership there and vision to drive serious and decisive change? On the face of it, a new world leader like Barack Obama would have to have extraordinary capacities to bring these different countries together and forge a new internationalism, multilateralism. Can we create it at this moment, to borrow a phrase? Yes, we can. But are there formidable geopolitical obstacles to a new settlement? Yes, there are. 